Hello, you're on the Fulcrum Entertainment Channel. This is the Batman audiobook. My name is Harrison Bullman, and I'm about to read for you Batman Arkham Knight, The Riddler's Gambit by Alex Irvine. If you want to start at the beginning of the audiobook, there are links to playlists and every part of the book in the description below. But before I start reading, let's talk to people in the comments. A new commenter, I don't know, I think I've noticed your name before, Airlope22, says the new Batman movie is a 5 out of 5 Batarangs. Phenomenal acting, writing, scenery, mood and music. Thank you very much, Airlope22. And yes, that uh, movie review question is still out there. Anyone who hasn't told me what they think of the new Batman movie yet, let me know in the comments below. Wolfmouse21 also says, Thank you so much for this. I was wanting to listen to The Riddler's Gambit, but there was no audiobook. I can finally listen to this book. I also love the different voices you give to the characters. This is wonderful. Yes, I am so happy that we can provide this service of um, getting out an audio version of these books to people who love them. Um, I do hope that everyone, you know, if you can, please uh, support the original author, Alex Irvine, and go buy the book. It's uh, $4.99 here in the UK um, on Google Books, I believe it is. But unfortunately, there is no official audiobook, so I guess there's just us, the Fulcrum Entertainment Channel. Thanks so much, Wolf Mouse. I hope you continue to enjoy it as we finish off the book. Uh, Will West. Will, who says, so funny, I just heard my name and comment. Haha, <laughs> laughing emoji. Dude, I'm loving your audiobooks. Just love it. Keep it up. Thanks so much, Will. And yes... If you comment here on the Fulcrum Entertainment channel, I am going to try and respond to everyone I can in the videos right now. In fact, I'm going to respond to some people a little bit later on, because we had so many replies to the last video. But let's not forget the main reason why we're here, and start reading Chapter 18. It took Batman approximately two minutes to get from the Ace Chemical Factory, through Park Row, and across the barricaded part of the old Gotham Freeway, to Amusement Mile, where the Gotham Casino stood near the old police headquarters, which had been abandoned since early in Commissioner Gillian B. Loeb's tenure. Once the casino had been Oswald Cobblepot's showplace, but Batman had seen and heard nothing from the Penguin since the end of Protocol 10. Was he now in league with the Mad Hatter, and by extension the Riddler? It wasn't out of the question. Perched on the small water tower near the once lavish building, Batman looked down at the street side. Its grand façade was shabby and neglected now, much of the neon shattered. The only cars on the street were abandoned. He had left the Batmobile on the freeway access road near the southwest corner of the Gotham City Olympus. No light was visible through any of the casino's windows, but that didn't mean anything. Like all of its kind, the Gotham Casino's gaming area was sequestered from the rest of the world. Management liked to keep its gamblers away from windows and clocks, so it was easier for them to get lost in chasing that ever-elusive big score. He dropped to the street and approached the front door, easily bypassing the lock. He entered the casino, passing through a huge dark lobby hung with chandeliers. Their dangling crystals picked up light from an open doorway across the way giving the lobby ceiling the effect of a starry sky. Batman heard the ratchet and jingle of slot machines. He crossed to the door and looked through. The floor was alive with activity, all of it confined to a single area. A long row of people, all dressed in frock coats and silk suits, formal right down to the white spats on their shoes, moved from slot machine to slot machine, each pulling the lever once and then moving on after seeing the result. Behind them came others, wearing rabbit ears and uniforms decorated with the four suits of a deck of cards. They wrote with quill pens on long, dragging sheets of paper, recording the result of each spin and scurrying to keep up with their formerly dressed partners. Some of them looked up and saw Batman but his presence didn't affect their activity. They looked at him, 
looked over their shoulders as if someone must be watching, and then hurried on. Jervis Tetch! Batman's voice carried over the clangor of the machines, yet everyone on the casino floor continued to ignore him. He walked along the rows of slot machines, scanning the room for the Mad Hatter, but not finding him. As the next gamer rushed past obliviously, Batman reached out and grabbed him by the collar of his coat. Where's the Mad Hatter? he growled. Unhand me! the man cried. His eyes were wide with fear, but Batman didn't seem to be the source. I'm frightfully late! Still, the crime fighter retained his grip. If anything, he tightened it. Where is the Mad Hatter? Batman repeated. He gave the man a shake. I beg you, sir, I do not know who that is. Let me go. There are arms to pull, numbers to see. Calculations must be performed. Batman let him go. With a gasp of relief, the man scrambled to the nearest slot machine and pulled its arm. The wheels spun and returned a lemon, a cherry, and a number seven. The rabbit-eared woman, following the patron dutifully, recorded this, and then they were off to the next machine. The casino floor had perhaps two hundred slot machines, and not all of them were being pulled in sequence. There was a pattern here, and Batman knew he would have to see it from above to understand it, if understanding it was worth the effort. Knowing Tetch, it would be some lunacy from Carol's book, The whole place stank of fear. Those who didn't believe fear had a smell had never been in its presence. There are numbers in the air here, the Mad Hatter said from nearby. Batman turned to see him in the dealer's position behind a blackjack table, his stringy straight hair falling out from beneath that ludicrously large top hat. The Dark Knight walked toward the table, and the Hatter dealt him two cards. Batman looked at the cards. Ace of spades, ace of clubs. He glanced back up at the Mad Hatter, who beamed at him. Mustn't act rashly, he said. Split, Batman said, flipping the aces over and lining them up next to each other. I do love an ace, the Mad Hatter said. It means one, it means eleven. Those other cards, they're prisoners of their letters and numbers. Only the ace breaks free. From somewhere nearby, a raucous bell sounded loudly. Batman glanced over and saw a river of coins pouring out of the slot machine's payout tray. Jackpot! crowed the Mad Hatter. The entire crew of gamblers and rabbit-eared scribes converged on that machine. The man who had won the jackpot fell to his knees and covered his face as the coins continued to fall around him. The scribes scribbled on their scrolls, and the other players all drew knives from within their fashionable ensembles. A once in a lifetime event! The Mad Hatter bellowed as the slot pullers fell on their colleague. Before Batman could move a muscle, their bloody knives flashed in the lights from the machines. When their work was done, the Mad Hatter raised both arms. Now then! he cried. Mustn't be late. The patrons and the scribes ran in every direction, returning to the machines they had been approaching when the jackpot bell rang out. You're going to run out of slot pullers, Batman said grimly. He watched as the scribe who had been assigned to the doomed man took off her rabbit ears and approached the blackjack table. The Mad Hatter dealt her two cards. She glanced at them. Het. He dealt her a third card, the Seven of Hearts. She flipped over her other two cards. Eight of Hearts, Nine of Hearts. Bust, the Mad Hatter said. He drew a knife from the inside pocket of his coat. 
The scribe tilted her head back, exposing her throat. Bad man, the hatter continued. The Riddler wanted me to teach him the secrets of controlling the human mind. You see, I excel at this. The secret is simple. One must make the subject fear you more than he, or, in this case, she, fears death. Madness is quite useful in this regard. Batman held himself in check, but if the Mad Hatter moved the knife, the fight was going to be on. He wasn't going to sit there while Tet cut the throat of a brainwashed minion just for fun. You know what I love about a casino? the Hatter asked. The randomness. Nothing is rational here. People try to beat the odds. It's silly, even stupid but charming, because one sees human optimism and human desperation working together in intimate proximity. You know, the numbers we are creating here will lead me to my Alice. How? Batman asked to keep him talking. Because I, too, am a desperate optimist as you are. I'm more of a realist, Batman said. That's an ugly word. You fight and fight and fight and never win. But you keep fighting. If that qualifies as realism, you're closer to madness than I had ever hoped. You were telling me about mind control. Something changed in the ambient sounds, but it was subtle and didn't seem to be a cause for alarm. I do love that there are no clocks here, the Mad Hatter said, ignoring him. That permits me to convince my comrades that they are always on the verge of tardiness and lateness, tisk tisk, is most strictly prohibited. With no clocks, he continued. I determine the time. It's always six o'clock. He gathered himself and looked straight at Batman. Tell me, has Robin enjoyed the tea and bread I set out for him? You did that, Batman responded. If that's true, then you got here in record time. He said the tea was still hot when he came into the room. Did it, had it done, it's just a matter of verbiage. Words, we speak them, Kalu, Kalei, all mimsy were the Borogoves and some wraths out grave. Soon the numbers will reveal where my Alice has gone, and we will be together again. A dreamy smile spread over his face and he leaned toward the scribe, who still waited with her throat upheld for the blade. That's it. Batman reached out, caught the Mad Hatter's wrist, and with his other hand slapped him in the face hard enough to knock his hat off. A look of shocked dismay took hold of his features. That was uncalled for, oh dark knight, Hatter said. The look slipped and was replaced with a sad expression. He looked at his knife hand, imprisoned in Batman's grip. May I put my hat back on? Tell me about mind control and the Riddler. The Mad Hatter dropped the knife. It clunked, hilt first, onto the green felt of the blackjack table. With his free hand, he reached down to the deck of cards and dealt Batman two, one for each face-up ace. Keeping his grip on the Mad Hatter's wrist, Batman flipped over the cards. Eight of clubs, eight of spades. He had the proverbial dead man's hand. Who could have predicted that? the Mad Hatter said. Abruptly, Batman realized he wasn't hearing the sounds of slot machines. He glanced over his shoulder and understood why. The gamers were all gathered around the blackjack table, 
and they all had their knives out. As the first of them slashed at him, Batman pulled the Hatter's arm down, using his mass as a counterweight, and launching himself into a twisting backward somersault over the table and into the dealer's enclosure. He landed with the Hatter between him and the knives. Tetch sprang at Batman, who spun into a judo takedown, driving his opponent to the floor. The gamblers began to scramble over the table to get at him. He dropped the nearest with a straight right hand, doubled another over with a spinning kick, then felt the tug of a knife blade cutting through his cape and the sharp, bright pain of a blade nicking the back of his shoulder. One of the slot players grabbed him from behind. Batman countered with an elbow that blocked the slash of his knife and followed through to crunch into the side of his face. He glanced down and saw the Mad Hatter on hands and knees picking up his knife again. At the same time, another slot puller leapt from the table, knife high and aimed at Batman's face. He stepped forward, ducking his head and grabbing a double fistful of the knife puller's shirt and cravat. Pivoting, he brought the man down on the Hatter's back with the force of his thrust and the slot puller's momentum combined. The air woofed out of the Hatter's lungs and he rolled around on the floor gasping for breath as Batman stabbed a heel into the fallen gambler's head. He recovered just in time to dodge another knife thrust. Four down, but there were plenty more where they'd come from. In this confined space, sheer numbers would overwhelm him sooner or later. They were all on the table now, spread evenly around its half-circle. Their eyes were completely devoid of consciousness, as if they weren't aware what they were doing. The contrast with the Hatter's manic whimsy was even more unsettling than overt bloodlust. One of them jumped down into the dealer's enclosure, Batman dropped him as soon as his feet touched the floor, but in turning to do that, he exposed himself to others. A knife gouged at his ribs, slowed but not stopped by the protective material of his suit. He spun and kicked the wind out of his attacker, caught two others and smashed their heads together, then took another cut across the thigh as one of them flailed in mid-fall. Eight down. An idea occurred to him. That's eight, Tetch, Batman said. Half of my hand. You're the ace. With one hand, he fired a grappling hook up to the balcony. With the other, he grabbed the hatter around the waist. Still struggling to get his breath back, the villain didn't resist as Batman triggered the spooling mechanism on the grappling gun and jumped up out of the enclosure. He and the Mad Hatter swung up and across the floor to the balcony, where Batman braced his feet and heaved the Hatter up over the railing before vaulting after him. I do appreciate the symmetry of that, Tetch gasped. Quick thinking. Batman hit him hard, twice. His eyes rolled back in his head and then again slowly focused. Glancing down at the floor, Batman saw the gamblers looking around. Their scribes waited patiently as they searched the casino floor for Batman, and when they didn't find him, they simply went back to what they had been doing. It took some of them a while to recover from Batman's fists and feet, but soon the casino floor was jingling and clanging again with the sound of slot machines. Through the entire fight, the scribe assigned to the man who had won the jackpot hadn't moved. She still sat with her head tilted back and her eyes closed. Now that's dedication, the hatter said, wheezing loudly. <sighs> that's the dedication I feel for my Alice. Are you my Alice, darling? he called out. Yes she said, and her voice barely carried over the thirty feet that separated them. I'm your Alice. You found me. You're not Alice! He screamed in a sudden rage, his voice rising so high that it was almost a squeal. He strained against Batman's grip as if to jump off the balcony after her. Still, 
She didn't move. Batman pulled the hatter back and bounced his head off the floor a few times to refocus him on the matter at hand. Mind control, he prompted. Oh, yes, mind control. Off with their heads. Or, more properly, putting what's in my head in their heads, which amounts to the same things, wouldn't you say? He was still wheezing. The Riddler told me where you would be, Batman said. He sold you out, you and Mr. Freeze and Killer Croc. What's he trying to hide? Well, I did him a little favor involving Resh al Ghul's journals, but that hardly seems worth killing me for, the Hatter responded. A jackpot bell rang on the casino floor. The Hatter jerked and started to yell out another call to murder. Batman punched him in the gut and he doubled over, spending the next minute or so gagging and hacking. Looking out over the floor, Batman saw the slot pullers and scribes just standing around. They did nothing without the Mad Hatter's instructions. This was good. It meant that he could keep them alive simply by keeping the Hatter quiet. He squatted next to his opponent, who didn't look as if he was quite ready to stand up yet. Batman didn't care. He hauled the Hatter to his feet. Rachel Ghoul's journals, he growled. Continue. Well, I had to get the information from somewhere, the Hatter said. And I thought, who knew this kind of thing? Who had the secrets? Who had been the furthest down that particular? Well, rabbit hole, if you'll forgive the expression, and I know you will. Why, it would be a Resh al Ghul with his marvelously lamed Lazarus Pits. All I had to do was track down the journals he left behind when you dismissed him from this mortal coil. The Hatter paused. Or did you? Surely not. But you were present at the event and certainly complicit. Raish killed himself while he was trying to kill me, Batman responded. He died by the sword. I am not sorry it happened, but I didn't do it. Distinction without a difference, the Hatter said airily. In any event, I needed those journals. Thus, I sojourned into the ruins of Arkham City, daring the remnants of Tiger and other threats more dire. Then, I found a certain other party, who informed me that what I sought could be had. He paused, and his expression registered the memory of a painful experience. For a price... I'm not interested in the price, Batman said. Oh, I think you are. I was the one who coughed up the filthy lucre to convince Killer Croc to go to the dentist. Credit where credit's due, I always say. And once I had made that happen, I found the journals squirreled away in a little box. Incredible man, Rachel Ghoul, if man he was. Tetch stopped to catch his breath, then continued. The Riddler wanted me to teach him how to control machines with his mind, and Raish knew how to do it. I'm not even certain he knew what he had, but everything I needed was in his journals. Brilliant techniques I could combine with my own. I built the Riddler his device, right in this very building. Components from computers, elements of high-res cameras, even spare parts from slot machines. A casino is a wonderland of surprises. When you put them together... The Hatter's face got dreamy again. Magic happens. Mind control over machines. 
Lucas Angelo, a software developer specializing in robotics and control systems. Rosalind Matteo Sion, an electronics engineer. The pieces finally began to fall into place. The problem was, he didn't know the reason. He was caught up to the present, but had no idea what Nigma intended the future to look like. What machines? And when he established his mastery, if, in fact, he could do so, what was he going to accomplish with them? Batman stood and hauled the Mad Hatter bodily to his feet. As Tetch sought to gather himself, he shot Batman a strange look. When I asked whether or not you had dismissed race from this mortal veil of tears, he said, I wasn't questioning your motives, but the, shall we say, finality of the act. The statement sent a chill through Batman. What are you getting at? he demanded. Are you saying that he's alive? I'm saying that in the end, a raven is like a writing desk. Nothing else matters. With that, he launched into a torrent of gibberish, and no matter how Batman tried, he couldn't get anything more out of him. WriterReport.com, posted by J.K.B. Wednesday, 2.38 p.m. Vicky Vale is missing in Arkham City. Yes, you read that right. It's been widely reported already that she was going to meet the Riddler. Whether that's A, true, B, what she thought was true, or C, her cover story for whatever she was really doing, it doesn't matter. She went into the field chasing a story, and now she's missing, and her cameraman, a solid pro and stand-up guy named Phil Chester, is dead. This is the kind of story we have to write all too often here on the Writer Report. What Jack said on his show applies here, too. Batman appears, and everything in Gotham City goes haywire. Is that an accident? We don't think so. As we've been saying for years, this city would be better off without Batman, and we're not the only ones who think so. Raphael Del Toro, among others, feels the same way, and he's been around Gotham City even longer than Jack has. And there's been a fourth murder, right on the hour like the first three. This time, the victim was Teresa Gray, the manager of the mailroom and general factotum over at Gotham City Police HQ. She's the first victim who didn't have some kind of technology job, and her death shines a whole new light on Batman's visit to Commissioner Gordon. Why was he there? Could it have been to take a look at something that showed up in the mail? This passing through Teresa Gray's domain? Did Deadshot then kill her to ensure her silence? It's starting to make sense, isn't it? If you can call it sense... Continuing down that line of reasoning, it means Commissioner Gordon and Batman have known what this was all about from the beginning. They didn't tell you, and now people are dead. Is that any way to run a city? Is that any way to keep the people of this city safe? You be the judges. Now Vicky Vale is another victim of Batman's secrecy and Commissioner Gordon's complicity. She's in trouble, and all she was trying to do was her job. Report the truth as she saw it. We've had our dust-ups with Vicky Vale over the years and still think she's a soft-headed liberal stooge who's never spent a day in the real world, but that doesn't mean we wish her ill. She didn't deserve whatever has happened to her any more than Phil Chester deserved what happened to him, and the blame for that lies squarely on Commissioner Gordon's shoulders. Batman, too. Think about that the next time you feel like hailing either of them as heroes. All right, okay, we've seen some real divides in the media in Gotham City. I never realized that it went this deep. You know, I, I kind of knew we had these reporter characters, you know, um, from the comics. Vicky Vale, obviously. But I always saw it much more as that kind of, you know, um, 
the sort of old school 20s reporters, they were just there to report the news. There was no like actual nuance to it. There was no depth to that story. But hey, we've got, you know, like right wing and left wing. And we've got, you know, like, yeah, they're a liberal over there. And we've got this kind of Fox News attitude over with the Ryder Report. Crazy stuff. I didn't realize that it went this deep into uh, the world of Gotham City. A real great eyesight onto that. Eyesight? Insight. Pugh. So the chapter saw the Mad Hatter. What do you guys think of the Mad Hatter? Um, the Mad Hatter's an interesting character. That He's uh, one that can be done in a very goofy way. And obviously the Arkham games has tried to do it in a bit more of a serious way. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know how to feel about that character. In my head... He is always the really goofy kind of character from the Batman animated series. You know, he looks much more like um, an illustration from a copy of Alice in Wonderland, uh, rather than the kind of hobo with a top hat, uh, evil MacGyver kind of thing we get later on. Which is your preferred Mad Hatter? Is it something not from uh, the games or from the TV show? Is it a comic that has your favourite version of Bat? Um, sorry, of the Mad Hatter in it? Leave me a comment and let me know. And speaking of comments, Samuel Cuthbert. Hey, man, thank you so much for all your support. Uh, commented uh, in the last episode, amazing job, man. I could really picture it very clearly when you read. I obviously love this video, and I give this video uh, five out of five batarangs, and I eagerly await the next video next week. I really hope that your channel grows more and more, and you can continue to make a successful career out of what you love. Keep up the good work, and see you next week. Can't wait. Thanks so much, Sam. And yeah, I, you know what? I really hope that uh, maybe one day I can make some money out of this. I don't know, but for now, I'm happy doing it uh, just for the love and for the joy. And certainly, um, the kind of having the image of it is my favourite thing about reading. My favourite thing about audiobooks. I love the theatre of the mind, as people say. Imagining the images for myself, um, you know, and having my own versions of these stories in my head. That's, that, that is my kind of favourite thing about it. I really hope that um, I can give that to you guys. But I can't if I don't read, so I'll continue now with chapter 19. Robin was already moving when Harley Quinn's hand dropped to her belt, and the shot shattered the family portrait on the far wall, instead of punching a hole through his face. He cartwheeled to his right, coming up with the bow ready. She threw the gun away and drew another one. Ready to play? You keep changing the rules, Robin said. That's the game, silly, she said. She leveled the new gun, then made a comical show of squeezing one eye shut and sighting down the barrel. The gun was tiny. In her small hands, it looked like a toy. Even so, Robin would bet his life that it would fire a real bullet. And in this game, I always win, Quinn added. She started to squeeze the trigger when the back wall of the execution chamber caved in and a huge humanoid figure burst through the rubble. A blinding flash lit the room and Quinn was blasted off her feet by an energy bolt from a gun mounted on the robot's shoulder. As she sat up and shook her head, the figure lumbered into the room and placed itself midway between her and Robin. Its eyes glowed a baleful green. She looked up at it. Wow, she said, and pointed comically. Off with his head too! Then she dissolved into uncontrolled giggles. It was one of Wonder City's famed mechanical guardians, built by Rachel Ghoul decades ago. Robin had seen them before, but never operational. I thought you wanted me to live long enough to see the Riddler's big show, he said to Quinn, his eyes still on the robotic newcomer. You dummy, that's what I wanted you to think, she answered with a laugh. I don't care what the Riddler wants. He never gave a damn about Mr. J. You'll see. She scrambled to her feet, having recovered from the robot's blast with surprising speed. Time to go, I guess. She skipped to the edge of the hole in the wall. I hope the Riddler doesn't kill you, sweetie, she said over her shoulder. That would be so disappointing. She blew him a kiss and was gone. The robot stayed where it was, frozen. Was she on his side or not? Robin shook his head. 
Every time we run into her, I end up with a headache. Too much bull- Ouch! Vicky Vale said. He turned and saw her hiding behind the couch at Shay's Lounge, he corrected himself. Looking at the inside of her arm, a trickle of blood ran down her wrist to drop from her thumb. That's a sharp blade! She'd cut the zip ties with the axe blade. When did you do that? Robin asked. While you were chatting about memento moris, or mementos mori, whatever, she said, all that. Sorry, Robin said. If you'd waited a second. I'm not big, I'm waiting, Vale said. Especially not when someone's just tried to cut my head off. Now, I need to get out of here and file this story. She stood up, bracing herself for a moment with her uninjured arm. I wouldn't go just yet, Robin said. He walked across the execution chamber and looked through the hole in the wall. A rough tunnel, almost looking like a natural cave, led away to what he thought was the north, sloping down into the blackness. A glimpse behind the Riddler's curtain, Robin thought. He's built in emergency measures to make sure nobody interferes with his game, and he had control of at least one of the mechanical guardians. I didn't think those things really existed, Vale said. She walked up to the robot and looked it over. It was much taller than she was, taller in fact than any human. Well, they do, Robin said. This one's been customized, I think. It doesn't look like the other ones I've seen. The mechanical guardians he'd encountered before were skeletal in design, except for their torsos, which had to be larger to house their energy supplies. They reminded him of some robots he'd seen in old Superman cartoons. Their heads were roughly the same shape as a human head. Where human eyes would be, mechanical guardians had two glowing lenses. They had different built-in weapons too, or at least this one did. Where the original guardians had been engraved with Victorian-style filigree, with a Jules Verne aesthetic, this one had question marks engraved on its armoured exoskeleton. How many others have you seen? Robin shrugged. A few, down in Wonder City. You've been to Wonder City? He turned to look at her as he realised he was being interviewed. Miss Vale, this isn't a good time. Are you for real? Every time is a good time when it comes to getting a story. That's what I do, kid. But... We can talk about Wonder City some other time. Let's get back to what you said about Batman losing someone he loves. Ouch. You heard that, huh? She smiled. I sure did. Well, you heard all you're going to hear, he said, making it sound final. About that, anyway. You want to talk about the Riddler, we can do that. If we do it fast. I have to get out of here, and for all I know, I just ate something really bad. Do you think you've been poisoned? There was something more than interest in Vicky's voice. Almost glee, Robin thought. That's sick. Maybe it was the idea that she was onto a story of life and death, here in the ruins of Arkham City, that made her sound so hopeful. No, if the Riddler just wanted to kill me, he replied. He's had more than his share of chances. How many more chances are you going to give him? Vale asked. Shouldn't you and Batman be taking a more active role here, instead of letting the Riddler lead you around by your noses? That stung. Look, he said, his jaw tight. Not too long ago, Batman dug you out of a wrecked helicopter. Just now, I stopped Harley Quinn from giving the Riddler your head as a trophy. I think maybe you should allow us a little discretion. Discretion isn't something I do too well, doll, Vale said. But I do appreciate what you did. She almost sounded as if she meant it. Appreciate it enough not to endanger more lives when you get out of here, Robin said. Okay. He looked straight at her, hoping she got the message. She held his gaze for a long time. Then she nodded. Okay. 
she pulled her phone out of a pocket and snapped a few pictures, getting shots of the mechanical guardian and various angles around the two rooms, including the broken axe head buried in the wooden block. So, how are we getting out? Well, that's the thing, Robin said. The way I get out of here is going to lead to a situation even more dangerous than this one. I can't be responsible for your safety. Don't patronize me, she said. I'm not patronizing you, I'm telling you. If you'd been in the last room where the Riddler sprang a trap on me, you'd be dead. So, either you stay here, or you figure some way out. Fine, Vale said. She walked into the parlor and under the hole in the ceiling, peering upward. Where does that go? That's how I came in, Robin said. It won't be the way out. Not for you. Then I guess that just leaves me with one option, she said, walking back into the execution chamber. She paused at the hole in the far wall. Say, do you think, um... Do I think Harley Quinn is still in there? Robin said. Probably not. The Riddler isn't happy with her for not finishing the job, and she knows it, so my guess is that she's making tracks for somewhere far away from him. But you saw her. There's no way to be sure what she's going to do. Yeah, you got that right, Vale said. She stood there for a long time, while Robin resumed combing the room for a clue. Well, this is a hell of a story. It's worth some risk. But she didn't move. What do you think will happen if I stay here? I have no idea, Robin said truthfully. Okay, she said. Well, thanks again for saving my life. You're welcome. She tapped her phone screen. How come I don't get any bars down here? She said, mostly to herself. It's stupid. She tapped the screen and turned on the video flash to use as a torch. Well, here it goes, she said, and she disappeared into the passage. Robin waited and listened. He didn't hear any screams or sounds of mayhem. Vicky can take care of herself, he decided. It was his job to get back to the chessboard and find the Riddler. Taking them to Trask, Dwayne Trask, Gotham Globe Radio. We're taking your calls. Lonnie in the Heights. <laughs> did, did you see what just happened? <laughs> I just saw Deadshot. He went by my window and he, like, pointed at me and did the, the finger gun thing. Bang! <laughs> Lonnie? I hear the laughing in the background. You and your stoner pals can take a long walk off a short pier. Matilda, you're on taking them to Trask. Dwayne, I think you have a very good perspective on what's going on here. Well, uh, I'm glad to hear you say that, Matilda. I appreciate it. Uh, what's on your mind? Where's Robin and all this? Do you think something's happened to him? I don't know if I like Batman or not, but I do like that Robin kid. Oh, I'm sure he's fine, Matilda. He's very resourceful. Uh, thanks for the call. Uh, Ivan's across the river looking down at us from the Palisades. What's on your mind, Ivan? There's something weird going on in the river. What do you mean? Well, I look down at the same part of the river every day from my office window. There's a part of it that looks different now. The currents are all different, and there's like a, well, I don't know the word, like water's bubbling up there from down at the bottom. Is that right, Ivan? When did this happen? Well, a couple of hours ago, I was eating lunch and, you know, uh, looking out at the river and, and the city. Then all of a sudden, there's like this surge of bubbles and stuff. Um, you should see it. We will. We'll take a look. Thanks for the call, Ivan. Huh. This morning, Batman was seen at the flood control facility, and now, apparently, the currents have shifted in the West River just downstream of Arkham City. Could Batman have done something to outflow the tunnels? They're everywhere along that part of the riverfront. Some of them might have changed the current, or, hey, now I'm really going to speculate. When the old steel mill was running, 
It dumped a lot of water along the riverbed there. Wastewater from cooling operations, mostly. Now, we're hearing rumors of activity in that area and maybe explosions, too. Ivan might just be onto something. We'll check it out and report back as soon as we know anything. Otto, you're on the air. Who was that last guy? With currents in the river, what's next? Someone's gonna claim that Batman's fighting UFOs! And that is the end of chapter 19. And I feel like that's a little bit of foreshadowing there. Like Batman's fighting UFOs! What a crazy idea. We would never see Batman fighting UFOs or something that looked like a UFO. Perhaps some form of Wonder City technology that maybe the Riddler has kind of converted into a flying machine. That definitely looks like a classic UFO. No, that could never happen. I think that might happen. I want to ask you guys a question, right? About what just happened in that chapter. So, the, the robot busts through a wall. Robin's like, oh. There are tunnels where these robots can presumably come in and out of these rooms to make sure that no one messes with it. I'm guessing the robot is essentially security. Because Harley tried to kill Robin, the Riddler sent in the robot to stop him. And the Rid um, sorry, Robin says, oh, this is a glimpse behind the game at the Riddler. I don't understand why the Robin didn't immediately investigate down that tunnel. Now, I appreciate that, yes, the Riddler is most likely watching, but I think it would be important to know what else is going on there, because either it's something that the Riddler has planned for, so there might be something of use for him there, or it's something the Riddler hasn't planned for, and then it's his moment to take advantage and to find a way out of the Riddler's games. I don't know, I'm surprised that he's just gone, nope, I've said I'll do the chessboard, it was a gentleman's agreement, I'm going to continue with the chessboard. But, what do I know? I am not a caped crusader, I have not been fighting crime since I was in short shorts, and as a little boy running around the streets I was not an orphaned acrobat. So I don't know what it's like to be Robin. Maybe he has some insight that's much better than mine. But what do you think? What would you have done in that situation? While you're writing comments, I'm going to read a comment. I am very pleased to see that Sweet Mango Limited has taken my recommendation from last week and said, Atomic Wolf, here I come. Thanks, Harrison. And really happy to hear that you've uh, listened to the first episode already and loved it. Really happy to hear it. So I mentioned last week that if you're on YouTube, go looking for Atomic Wolf here on YouTube. They are uh, a channel that make incredible audio dramas set in the Fallout and Fallout New Vegas uh, universe. They also have done some audio dramas set in Rapture in the Bioshock universe, uh, two of which I have been in. Uh, and I've been in quite a few of the Fallout ones as well. So if you're here on YouTube, go check them out. Or if you prefer to listen to podcasts, go on whatever podcast app you've got and go looking for True Vault Escapades and you'll find the adventures of Walter and Bunny a detective series that occasionally features me. But we're not done here yet, so let's read chapter 20. So the Riddler had plans in place for when Robin, or, as it happened, Harley Quinn went off script. That bit of information was key. It meant Nigma didn't have absolute certainty in his own planning. For most people, it would have been commendable caution. But, for the Riddler, it was almost like an admission of failure before the game had even begun. Or, what if the whole thing was staged? That made more sense to Robin than the accidental intrusion of Harley Quinn. She had staged the whole thing in consultation with the Riddler. So if Quinn was the Red Queen... Did that mean the king would be waiting back on the chessboard? And Vicky Vale hadn't just wandered into Arkham City. No, she'd been there on a tip. Part of the Riddler's gambit was pure ego. He wanted publicity for what he was doing, and if Vale found her way back up to the surface, he would get it. That 
made it likely that she would make it out alive, no doubt along some long-forgotten passage that would lead her back to the surface. Robin could try the same path, but he doubted the Riddler would let him get away with it. That would be too far off script and probably would get him killed on the spot. It might lead to Vale's death as well. So he turned back to the tea set. He hoped he could figure this out quickly. Sooner or later, he would start to experience the effects of whatever Quinn had made him eat, and he wanted to be out of this room before that happened. He counted the cups. There were twelve of them, placed around the edge of the table. The teapot sat in the middle, and the long bread plate created a line between the teapot and one of the cups. Then he remembered the Riddler's note. Time is of the essence! The tea set was arranged like a clock. What was it the Mad Hatter had said in Alice Adventures in Wonderland? It's always six o'clock now. Then a bright idea came into his head. Robin went to the grandfather clock and opened the glass door that protected its face. Carefully, he spun the minute hand around until the hands formed a single straight line. Six o'clock. He tensed, waiting to see. Nothing happened. Robin looked around to make sure he hadn't missed anything. But there had been no change. Everything looked exactly the same. What was he not seeing? Suddenly, it struck him. It was always six o'clock. Always. Turning back to the clock, he stopped the pendulum swinging in its case. The minute hand had already ticked forward a tiny bit, so he shifted it back until the hands were at precisely six o'clock again. This time, there was a rattle from the ceiling and a louder groaning of machinery. A short ladder dropped from the hole through which Robin had entered, although it didn't reach the floor. Gauging its height, Robin figured he could jump and catch the bottom rung easily enough. Before he did, though, Robin once again considered making this exit through the hole in the wall, just as Vicky Vale had. Would that enable him to complete the puzzle without having to contend with door number seven? He made his way back into the execution room and studied the opening. With a grinding of gears, the Guardian started to move again. Robin skipped back from the hole, ready to fight it if he had to. But the mechanical monster simply ignored him. It stomped back to where it had entered, turned around to face out into the room, and held its position. Well, that answers the question, Robin thought. None shall pass. The Riddler had to be watching his every move. When it looked like he was going to deviate from the plan, Nygma had used the robot to make his point. Whatever opportunity he might have had to throw a wrench in the Riddler's works, it was gone now. Still, if Harley could go rogue... Hey, Riddler, he called out. What, are you losing control? Maybe just a little? Could it be that people aren't playing along the way you want them to? With that, he waited to see what would happen. A question mark lit up on the ceiling near the open hatch. That confirmed it. The Riddler wasn't just watching his progress as he made it through the death rooms. He was listening in, and making sure things went according to plan. His comm pinged. Robin answered. Before we say anything, he said, you should know that the Riddler is listening. Of course he is, Batman said. That's no surprise. It's not meant to be, Robin said. It's confirmation. You talk to him? In a way, Robin said. Harley Quinn dropped in playing the Red Queen, with Vicky Vale on the chopping block. They're both gone now. The Riddler sent a mechanical guardian to stop Harley from messing with his script, but she got away scot-free. Interesting, Batman said. So he has contingency plans. Either that, or he staged the whole thing, Robin said. I don't think it's a coincidence that she was wearing a Red Queen costume. Do you? Maybe not. How did he manage to take Vicky Vale as a hostage? She wouldn't have just wandered into the Riddler's labyrinth. 
The way she told it, she was tipped off that there was a story to be had. About you. She went looking where the tipster told her to go, and instead of a story, she found Harley. Fun, right? Vale slipped out the way the robot came in. When I gave it a try, the metal thug made it clear that it wasn't an option. Be ready for Vale to deliver a story from the front lines, though, he added. You're likely to figure prominently. Next time her helicopter crashes in the middle of a war zone, she can get herself out, Batman growled. I'm a little surprised the Riddler didn't have the Guardian go after Quinn, though. He doesn't take it well when people interfere with his productions. Like I said, that makes me think the whole thing was staged. The Riddler's priority is keeping me on track, Robin said. He put on this particular pageant so we could have Vale air a nice, dramatic story about him on TV. But that's not the issue at hand, he continued. The question is... Do I tell the Riddler where he can stuff his gambit and take advantage of the other way out? It sounds as if you'll have to go through the Guardian to do that, Batman said. That's a tall order. I can handle the Guardian, Robin said, hoping he sounded convincing. But what's the Riddler going to do if we bail on his game? Are you asking me or him? I'm just playing my role, Robin answered. If he didn't want me asking, he would have handled the situation differently. The question mark started blinking. Do you think he can hear me? Batman asked. Sometimes I can barely hear you, Robin answered. But no, I've got you coming in through an earpiece. Unless he's cracked our encryption, he's relying entirely on my voice. Good move, Batman said. The timer is ticking down again, and I have a hunch about who's going to be next. Who is it? How did you figure it out? Oracle found a common element in each victim's recent history. They all exchanged phone calls with a number that led through dead ends and misdirection to a company called Conundrum Solutions. There were crates with that name on them in the Ace Chemical Factory where Mr. Freeze was working. Clever, Robin said. Conundrum Solutions. Good thing we weren't keeping that a secret, Batman said. Crap! I wanted the Riddler to hear it, Robin responded. He looked around the room, wondering where the camera and microphone were. Right, Batman said. Then he continued. Oracle found two more numbers that had multiple contacts with Conundrum during the relevant time frame. One of those numbers led to Teresa Gray although we didn't know that until it was too late. She worked for Gotham City Police in the mailroom. Uh-oh, said Robin. Then the Riddler had a mole inside. Either that, or he coerced Gray into passing the package containing the USB drive through the system. Commissioner Gordon, as you can imagine, isn't handling it well. How many more loose ends does the Riddler plan to tie up? We're already at four. The fifth one is Pierre Oulette who owns a chemical supply company. Commissioner Gordon is hiding him at a safe house. He won't even tell me where it is, or I'd question Ouled myself. A chemical supplier? Robin said. That explains where the hydrogen and oxygen came from in the molecular puzzle room. Exactly, and that's the last number in the group, Batman said. The Riddler's almost done tying up his loose ends. Robin heard the Batmobile's engine start. So did you track down the Mad Hatter? I did, and I got some information from him. Though not as much as I'd hoped. He's designed a device that allows the Riddler to control the mechanical guardians remotely. The details weren't clear, but Ted said it was a form of mind control. I'm not sure how accurate that characterization is, though, coming from him. Over the exit, the question mark started blinking faster. The mechanical guardian's faceplate lit up again, and it raised its arms. Gotta go, Robin said. I think the Riddler's getting antsy. If he's mind-controlling this guardian, then he's telling me it's time to get moving. Keep me posted on door number seven, Batman said. And watch out for more of the robots, he added. Then he clicked off. The mechanical guardian extended an arm. At the end of it, was a lens starting to glow. The question mark was blinking very fast. All right, I hear you, Robin said. 
He jumped up and caught the bottom rung of the ladder, leading back up into the roof chute. When he came through door number six, the chessboard was empty. No pawns, no king. The original three chessmen were gone. Door number seven was directly across the board. This was the last thing Robin had expected. Where was the king? He took a step forward to the next square, ready for anything, but nothing happened. Nothing kept right on happening as he stepped on the second square, and the third, and right on across the board to number seven. This was the end game. Everything was coming full circle. His conversation with Batman reinforced it. The murder victims had a common link, and each puzzle they had solved was related to the USB drive and the material it contained. He took a moment to study the room again, to see if he had missed something. But the other doors were shut. The chamber already seemed to have been forgotten. The Riddler had moved on. It was time for Robin to do so as well. Just as it was time to find the king, and discern the meaning of I am Larval, he had a feeling the answer to both of those enigmas might just wait on the other side. Bullseye by Raphael del Toro The body count is climbing. People are scared. Parts of Arkham City appear to be exploding for unknown reasons. Wait, let me guess. Batman's back, isn't he? I've heard people say that Gotham City is sick. That it breeds criminals and psychopaths the way other cities breed tech startups and basketball players. I don't believe that. Nothing about Gotham City was predestined. We choose the kind of city we want to live in, and for some reason we've decided it should be a city overrun with lawlessness. We've chosen the one shining light of Batman to save us from all the things we've decided collectively we can't fix ourselves. In other words, we created Batman because he makes things easier on us. If there's Batman, that means we don't have to do anything to make Gotham City a better place. If there's Batman, we have someone to blame when things go wrong. As in, there's never a Batman around when you need him. He's someone to cheer when cheering makes us feel better about our own apathy. And that's the problem. It's not Batman's problem, it's our problem. No one's forcing us to have a city full of costumed villains and the occasional stalwart vigilante. We could have a normal city with normal problems and normal issues. Instead, we have Gotham City. What are we going to do about it? Today, apparently, nothing. Batman's chasing the Riddler and someone, possibly Deadshot, is blowing the heads off random people in the street, and all for what? If Batman wasn't there, what would the Riddler and Deadshot and Clayface and whoever else do? Who would they fight? Sometimes, I think that if Batman decided to move to Miami, the rest of the maniacs would follow him. Who wants to start a petition? We could call it the Citizens of Call for a Normal Gotham City. Would anyone sign it? Who knows? We're not known for our sense of civic engagement. Here's the thing. Everyone's always talking about how we need Batman. Okay, let's go with that idea for a minute. We need Batman. But why? That's something we can only answer ourselves. And at least today. While we're all glued to our TVs and radios waiting for the latest about the assassinations, today we're not going to answer that question. Apparently, we have better things to do. Ooh. Shots fired there at uh, our man Del Toro, who has a very Spanish name, but um, because he is such a sort of J. Jonah Jameson-style curmudgeon, it just feels natural to have that... God. Get me pictures of Spider-Man. What? You couldn't get Spider-Man? Get me pictures of Batman. They'll do. They're just as good. I can make people angry about Batman and Spider-Man. Spiders, bats, no one likes either of them. 
Well, for those of you who were uh, answering my question about what would you have done uh, with the new tunnel, we did get an answer, I suppose, with uh, Robin calling Batman and going through the possibilities and actually thinking it through. I was uh, actually kind of like, okay, that's cool. Like, this story says no. We stop and we think about things because this is Batman and Robin. Batman is a hero known for meticulous planning and doing, you know, the, the smart thing. Um, even though he is buff as all hell, he doesn't just punch his way out of situations. So I'm glad to see that we had that. This last room is going to be quite a mystery. I don't know what we're going to expect in there. Um, I'm with Robin. Uh, th there's nothing there on the chessboard, so why? What's, what's happening with that? Are we abandoning the chess theme? Um, what, what's what's going to be behind there? Is it going to be another villain, or is it finally going to be like a face-to-face -face thing with the Riddler? I'm really interested to see, and also what our boy... Um, the Mad Hatter was saying about Ra's al Ghul. Does he know something? Are we going to see something? Is there some sort of zombie Al Ghul over there? Has the Mad Hatter used bits of Ra's al Ghul to create his mind control device over the creatures of Wonder City? Or the, the robots of Wonder City? Hmm. All interesting things. What do you guys think? Do you think we're going to see any other members of the Rogues Gallery appear yet? Do we have time for another cameo? Or is it just Batman, Robin, and the Riddler now? The answers to these questions we'll have to find out next week because we've come to the end. So I'm going to finish off with a couple more comments. One from Will West. Thanks so much for joining, Will. Who's saying, thank you, man, thank you. You're making thousands of people enjoy their job a lot more. I, I hope it's thousands of people. I, uh, wow, that would be amazing if it is. And, and I'm glad that I am helping you enjoy your job a lot more. I really genuinely am. Says, thank you, love the voices, and you killed it on the Arnold voice and Harley Quinn. Voice killed it. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, so much fun. The Harley one is so weird because it's like, uh, hey, dude, you you want to try and sound like a kind of sexy superheroine, anti-heroine hero? I don't know what you call her. Um, do you want to try doing that? Because I'm not sure you can pull it off. But hey, we gave it a go. And well, you know that I'm trying to be Harley Quinn at least, right? Yeah. Um, thanks so much, Will. I'm really glad to have you. I will see you next week, hopefully. In fact, hopefully I'll see you all next week. And particularly, I have to finish off with one last comment from Sweet Mango Limited, who's trying to help me out uh, and the comments there, doing some of the work for me. So this is what Sweet says. Says, the Riddler is awesome. Keep up the great work, bud. Alarm set for next week now. Tick tock. Like, comment, and subscribe, guys. See, Sweet Mango Limited told you to do it now as well. So now Sweet said it. I'm going to say it too. Please, if you've enjoyed the video, give it a like. If you want to hear the end of the book, subscribe. Hit the bell icon so you know when the videos come out. And the biggest thing of all, if you really like this, tell someone else about it. Be like, hey, I listened to this Batman book. It was cool. It's free. Go listen to it as well. That is the best thing you could ever do, and we really, really appreciate it. But it's now time to leave. Thanks very much, everyone. I will see you next Wednesday.